This is a recording of a virtual event Bogan Books hosted with author Carrie Arsenal. I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to spend some time with her. Carrie is the book review editor at Orion Magazine and a contributing editor at LitHub. She serves on the board of the National Book Critics Circle. Milltown is a nonfiction work, part memoir and part investigative journalism. Please join me and Carrie in conversation as we discuss her writing, her book, and her main community. But thank you for, for having me. I'm, I'm really excited. I so wish I could be there. I mean, I haven't been to Fort Kent since I was a kid, which we'll hear a little bit more about later, I think. Um, but to describe for those of you who don't know what Milltown is, um, the book that is, um, it's about Rumford in Mexico, Maine, where, where for three generations, my family lived and worked and I had a happy childhood. I believe it was, it was great, but I feel like we paid a price for that. I paid a price for that childhood and we all did in our town because while the mill provided stability to our town, it also contributed to the destruction of our health um, and our town's health and yeah. it continues to do so. Um, and it examines, it is complicated, but I'd say that maybe there's three things that it really examines. Um, the rise and collapse of the American dream and the working class, the hazards of loving and leaving home and the ambiguous nature of toxics and disease. And as for what it is or where you put it on a shelf, maybe you can tell me where you put it, but I don't know. I. I <laughs> It's a memoir, it's an investigative journalism and, and cultural criticism too, um, asking what or who are we willing to sacrifice for our own survival. Um, now, where do you put it on a shelf? Well, we have it in three different places, to be honest with you. We've had it highlighted in the middle of the shop Excellent. and we've had it in our nonfiction section and Bogan Books is not a big bookstore, so um, I can get away with stuff like that where we don't have many subsections. If people are looking for a certain subsection, I just kind of walk them over to it and show yeah. them. Uh, but we also have a very robust main section, especially for a small bookshop shop. And it tends to be a huge interest point for a lot of our readers, even uh, the people that are visiting us from away. Right. Uh, so we do have it in there as well. And, um, but it, it is, it's a big book and it, it, it you know, it, complicated and it has a lot of information in it but I will tell you and I, I shared with you a little bit about this earlier that I was very humbled reading this I felt like it was so well written and uh, just your your mastery of language was really cool um, I'm a big fan of somebody that takes time to describe an area or a place and you've done that really well throughout the book and you carry this this title of being from here right. um but you were sharing with me a little bit about how you've also had to confront this idea that you're also uh, seen as somebody from away right yeah um yeah i i mean it's a constant sort of negotiation right um and I think it's kind of a large part of what this book is about, because if you if you strip everything away from the book, right, the descriptions, the dialogue, the character, the structure, everything, it's really the plot is just me going home and leaving and me going home and leaving. So as I do that, as I return and leave, I think it it sort of reflects that calibration that you're talking about, about distance and proximity to a place, about being an insider and an outsider you know, yeah. um, and that, you know, and, and as I go back and forth to, I, you know, each departure and return, I would say I was constantly sort of building sort of an understanding of that place and of myself at the same time, kind of like making a snowball, right? Yeah. I was saying this the other day in a class, it was, it's like, I go home and I'd say, okay, um, you know, this is what I th thought it was like, or this is what it was like when I was a kid. And this is what it's like now. And this is how people see me now. And this is how I used to be seen. Those are all parts of like identity, which is a reflection of where you're from. Yeah. And so like, just put it like a snowball. You just keep putting, packing layers on. 
make that snowman. <laughs> <laughs> it's a snowman. Yeah. A snow woman. Um, but even, yeah, but even like, even, I think you, maybe you remember in the book, even how people see me is part of that identity too. Cause you don't, you don't just build your identity from who you think you are or who, where you think you're from. It's, it's really a collaboration between self and other people and how, and those tensions, I don't know. Yeah. Kind of that makes, I mean, I, I think that came through, I think, um, in reading it, that's, that became evident. And it's something that your process, um, probably made very apparent to you, but I think as a reader, I'm like, oh, but there was several different aspects of your book that I connected to personally, mm -hmm. uh, but not because I've shared the same life as you, you know, it's just, we share. So one thing I didn't know, this is kind of interesting is I, I've, I'm a, I have ancestors that are Acadian. Okay. I had no idea that there were Acadian, there was a Acadian community in Mexico, Maine. So oh, really, wow. I had no clue. Huh. And, and then, uh, but I learned that in reading your book. So that was really interesting for me. Um, I also think just to go back to your first question, it's, you know, being, so being, I didn't really quite, I didn't know, I didn't answer it really, but okay, go ahead. I'll I, let don't, you did I, I don't know. I forgot. I, I mean, being, I think home is really part of our identity is what I was kind of getting at, you know, yeah. and, and just because I don't live there, it doesn't mean I'm not from there. I'm completely from there. This is where I sort of got my base, you know, there's a passage to maybe I'll find it later to read sort of what I felt that that home means, but, but it, but yeah, it's what it's, it's the heart of everything. So <laughs> one of the things that impressed me about this is this is this book was almost 20 years in the making yeah the really if you start book? if you start 2001 when I started doing genealogy yeah so I guess it was and did that it was it the genealogy that inspired you to start this or what what was the inspiration to yeah start? the genealogy really I started looking up my family tree in 2001 um and the first piece of information I found was my grandfather's obituary. And it was, it had contained information about him that I didn't know, like where he was born, which ended up being Prince Edward Island um, and how he died, which ended up being from cancer and then who his mother was. And um, so I, I really wanted to seek out the details that were missing that I didn't understand. I didn't know they were missing until I started to try to find them. And then I realized mm -hmm. some of his obituary was actually wrong. Um, so that drove me to say, what else could be wrong in the documents of time, you know? You know, and yeah. as I found out in this book, much was and much is, you know? So like following, it made me, that obituary that was incorrect made me sort of follow absent ambiguous information and it laid the groundwork for the book and the structure of the book and um you know to to follow all the sort of tributaries of of unexpected and unknown paths it was to me that's the more interesting story anyway um as joan vermet who maybe she's on this phone call um you feel a historical reach to those ancestors too. It's not like you can completely understand them, but you, you know, as she put it, she, she said something so fascinating to me. Like I knew very briefly and very faintly my great grandmother. And then my great grandmother knew her great grandmother. So that's like, that goes back to the 1700s, you know, back Easy. when, you know, so that historical reach, there is a connection. There's that, you know, that link that that can sort of, you can feel that, I, I think. And there's also, you know, DNA and, and, you know, some studies show that, you know, not just like what color eyes you have, but you can inherit trauma in your DNA too. And, you know, the Acadians suffered a lot of trauma. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um there was a passage that you had written down in the book. Um, it says, 
Let us bear the cross without choice, without regret, without complaint. Let us bear the cross, however bitter and hard. And um, I, I read that and I'm like, oh my gosh, that is something that I really resonate with because when I was a, a little girl, there was this idea, if you suffered at all, just give that up to the Lord. That was the idea in, in that pain was for purpose. And, and you're talking about the DNA and, and of, of your ancestors, like, how did that come into play? And how, how do you resonate yourself with that? Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying I'm, I'm traumatized or anything, but I, but I do feel like you, you know, what you just said that, that, that passage was from Palaji, right? Is that what it's from that book? Um, yeah. I mean, Remember. you know, I grew up, yeah, was it? Yeah. I grew up the same way, you know, um, as that passage, which was written about Acadians trying to go back to their homeland in the, you know, 1800 or whatever it was, I can't remember. Um, but to sort of put your head down and do work and be loyal and be sort of supplicant in some ways. And, you know, we were brought up Catholic and it's not, it's not necessarily a bad thing that I'm, these things that I'm saying, but it can be if the wrong person wants to exploit it. Right. You know, that's the problem. The, the, the things that the, those kind of traits that we carry are, are wonderful traits, I think, to be, you know, loyal and hardworking um, and, you know, um, just keeping your mouth shut and doing your, doing your work. <laughs> like, I'm still like that, you know? <laughs> so right. that's how it's been, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but yeah, like exploited, I mean, exploited by, it could be by, I'm not saying that it was, it could be by religion. It could have been by the mill owner then, the mill owners now, it could be, you know, and it, it definitely was at some point or by our government who have, you know, who weak regulations to protect human health. Yeah. Things like that. So yeah, we, we were exploited. I'm just going to really be very broad about this because I'm not going to look it up, but there was a study where they were, it was a very recent study by like, I think it was NYU or Columbia University professors, it's in the book, um, asked, they did a study on silence in the workplace and they asked people in all kinds of different workplaces, whether it was mills or like offices or whatever, if you saw something wrong in the workplace, would you speak up? And 80% of the people responded, said, no, they wouldn't. And then they took those, that they took that study and applied it into Europe too. So it was first done in the United States and the same kind of thing came back. So 80%. So I was like, this isn't just like a French Catholic problem or, or an Acadian problem or a Maine problem. It's a human problem. A human problem. Absolutely. And so what is that? I mean, I don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the complications of the book. And, and I should say to everybody that my book asks more questions than it answers. And maybe <laughs> that's why it feels so like so much because I don't provide the answers, but it asks that question. It's like, why I am asking people, why are we staying silent? And, you know, this book is one way to sort of not stay silent. We're, we're very close here to a mill as well. I know. Yeah. You no. Know? And there's a lot of financial security and there's a life to be led because of that financial security that um, when you take that part of your worry away about making sure your family's okay, um, maybe you can live with the rest. Do you think that that came into the ideas of some of the people that work there? I do. And I have a perfect passage I would like to read about that. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> can Please. I? Yes. It, it kind of answers that. And it's also about Fort Kent. So <laughs> I, I love we, that part, by the way, that there is Fort Kent in this book. Fort Kent is in this book, everybody, for whoever's there in Fort Kent. I'm just going to, it's going to be very brief, um, I promise. And this is, um, I should preface this with Father Sear um, was our, our priest, and he's also from Fort Kent. So he is, I'm reading about him now. Father Joel Sear, yes. Father Joel Sear. He yeah. still lives there. You can all, he's famous now. <laughs> Father Sear was a sign, <laughs> and, and none of the, he doesn't drink martinis anymore, so I'm just going to say that. Um, Father Sear was assigned to our parish in the 1970s and arrived in a bright yellow Volkswagen Scirocco with an affinity for a very dry martini. 
The hours leading up to the weekend soirees my parents threw filled our house with the sting of onion as my father urged them through the meat grinder to make spaghetti sauce for the forthcoming crowd. As a part of the party prequel, my father would also smuggle the console TV upstairs so my sisters and I would not interrupt their fets. I'd sometimes spy on, on the grown-ups through the stair banister anyway, watching cigarettes flourish and highballs flash as everyone laughed and listened to Johnny Cash or Jesus Christ Superstar. <clears throat> I always thought my parents the most glamorous, of course. My mother decorated herself with lipstick and jewelry she rarely wore, like the necklace with brown, orange, and yellow maple leaves attached to a chain of brown Bakelite ovals that sounded like poker chips when I collected it in my hand. And my father, he looked like a young Robert Mitchum with the sad and shy dangerousness of a man who had nothing left to lose, his eyes as striking and as hard as a December sky. The morning after their parties, I'd scrub their dingy ashtrays and scarf the leftover deviled eggs while prying them from stories about the night before. Remnants of my mother's spicy Jean Nate bath splash garnished the air. <laughs> Sometime after I made my confirmation, Father Sear transferred to Fort Kent, <clears throat> Maine's northernmost town, which is populated by a large percentage of Acadian descendants who fled the deportation. People often choose to speak French there, including Father Sear, who grew up there, retired there, still lives there. We always used to call him on Christmas Day, passing the phone around the table because it was his birthday. My initials are JC, he'd howl and tease over the phone. And my birthday is December 25th. What do you think that means? <laughs> One summer when I was a teenager, we vacationed in Fort Kent with the Chessies, Irene, Maureen, and Joanne. Our mothers packed six kids, two tents, and a cooler full of bologna in our station wagon and sped north to Fort Kent. We pitched our tent on the Canada main border on the St. John River near the Fort Kent blockhouse and downstream from Madawaska's paper mill. At night, we rambled parentless along the riverbank, slapping mosquitoes while my mother, Irene, and father Sear drank cheap red wine at the nearby rectory. On the long drive home on Interstate 95 on the flat landscape, I'm sorry, <clears throat> I remember staring out the window watching pine trees and the flat landscape whiz by in a repeated pattern as if I were watching a Fred Flintstone cartoon where Fred would run through his house for what seemed an eternity and the same table, chair, and window looped in the background as he raced on. And now I'm getting to answer your question. <laughs> So Father Sear was at my mother's house. We were, he was going fishing. Um, and that night he, he insists the three of us go down to the Rumford Falls to watch the rising full moon. And we arrive in time to see it glance the hilltops in a haloed flame and sequin the river below. It's quiet, but for the water glissading across stone and our voices splintering up towards the heavens. Our faces are clammy and cold from the waterfall's mist. Were you ever bothered by the mill when you lived here? I asked Father Seer. Life is stronger than death, he says. That doesn't answer my question, I say. People are willing to suffer some of the crosses of death, like pollution, he says, for life. I look at my mother. I was a young mother. My focus was on family, she says. There's an element of hope that it's gonna get better, Father Seer says. There was always a certainty of a paycheck too. Plus there was also a richness to working in Rumford, he says and laughs. All mill, Ill, all mill towns in Maine are poor and the people stole a lot from the mill. <laughs> I remember I'd say to the guys working there, I need some paper and they'd say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, father, we'll get you some paper. In East Millinocket near where I lived, lumber, electric wire, the majority of their houses are from stolen products from the mill, the comedy of sin. Was it worth it, I ask? not the stolen things, but living here, was it worth the price? There were always better opportunities where it was dangerous, he says. It's always been that way. You have to have war to have peace. So take it from Father Seer. Yeah. It's always been that way, you know? There, we, we make compromises, I, I think all of us do in some way. You know, if, you're, if you order something from Amazon, you're compromising some you're compromising a bookstore independent bookstore right and an author <laughs> so exactly yep 
-hmm. And I don't think, I think there's a lot of education that go, and actually I think that's true about your book. There's a lot of education that's part of a process, right? Because we come to accept certain things and then uh, over time we start hearing things that might have us questioning what's going on. And then we start seeing a bigger and bigger picture. Right. It seems to be what happened with your book. Um, And with me. (laughs) Like you go along with me, like learning the same things I'm learning. It's in present tense, you know? Yes. Right. Um, So (laughs) I'll move on from the, um, I had a whole page on Father Joel Sear, but I feel that that reading really kind of summed it up. And and it was really nice to have that little uh, breath of humor that was included into the book because he is a funny guy and it was... (laughs) It's always interesting to get his perspective too. So um, that was nice. Um, Do you think, so, you know, Milltown, Rumford, Maine, Rumford, Maine has a mill and that's the mill that your, your father and your grandfather worked at. Is that true? And my great grandfathers and my great grandmothers and mother and grandmothers, like everybody, Um, both sides. Your family is really part of the bones of that mill. Yeah. These are people that have to get up and go to work. So who, first of all, who has time to sort of do this kind of invest this 20 year investigation or 10 year investigation that I did. So to think about it is one thing, but then to actually dig into it takes an enormous amount of time. And I, I didn't even have any, mine was all just very kind of amateur sleuthing and journalism. I mean, you know, sure. I went to school for journalism and this and that, but I didn't have any sort of academic background or ba- backing, I should say, or a magazine helping me, you know, having an assistant. I mean, I just had like piles of paper just strewn around the room. So like, who has time for that? You know, if you're working seven to three or three to 11 or right. whatever. Who, Life who is has, big, right. Life That's- is just, you just, like my mother said, I was a young mother. I was worried about kids. I didn't have time to like, you know, she had five kids and like diapers and Right. softball games and who has time for that so right. you know that's one part of it and then you know it, and it's again it's that distance and proximity thing when you're when you're up close to something you're just dealing with it on that daily basis but when you have time like time and space like I did away you see things a little differently and it's just sort of me you know I mean it's it's pretty it's pretty horrible to realize that like all your friends and family are, are getting sick from probably environmental pollution and it's ongoing and it's impossible to sort of get anything done about it or even to prove it. I think that's that more than the sadness to me is the frustration of, you know, uh, connecting, loosely connecting the dots or putting the dots on the page for all of you to connect, you know, again, the questions instead of the answers, because the answers are, are like, are like, you know, black holes, <laughs> right. You know, yeah. the, the closer you get to them, the further they get away. Or is that some, I don't know. There was probably some space analogy for that, <laughs> but like the closer you get, the further the answers seem to be. So, so that's really the frustration for me. So, you know, in the end, I just, I really think it, it needs to, the, the regulations themselves are the things that need to be questioned and the leaders that we choose and vote for are the ones that need, we need to put their feet to the fire. Yeah. You know, your, how mother, can... your mom, I'm sorry, your mom, ahead, she, said, she just wrote in the comments, we all knew what the dangers were, but as you said in your book, it was where we lived and it was accepted. And, uh, you know, and sometimes you don't have a choice. I mean, some, right. some people don't have a choice too. You know, at, at a certain point you get, you know, you're there and you have this job and you're making money and your kids are all in college. And it's like, you know, they have a choice to get up and move or, you know, no. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You think about that disruption and it sometimes it's easier to just deal with what you know than go somewhere else and deal with not knowing what you're going to be running into. You know, that's another idea of that. Yeah, that's a lot of reasons not to leave. And and as one person in the book said, she didn't leave because of love. Like she loves a lot of people there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I understand. Yeah. 
Um, so, oh, I had just, I guess I'm, I've really deviated from my questions, but that's I know I, I probably made you deviate. No, <laughs> that's not a problem. It's really okay. It's actually better for conversation. Um, we can have a second one if you want. Yeah. Uh, before, before I go into this next questioning, I was wondering, um, remind me how many of your family members um, if you don't mind, this is kind of personal, but you also sure. talk about it in the book, um, ended up having cancer at some point in their life. Um, so my grandfather and my father, so his father, his father, and my grandmother. And I don't know, mom, you could maybe help me out. <laughs> Jeez. So at least, I mean, those, those three people died from cancer. And of course my, you know, my father, my grandfather, and my um, grandmother all died of cancer. Okay. So three, you know, time time will tell for me, right? <laughs> or for any of my siblings. Um, you know, it's interesting too. Is um, yeah, that's what we know of. See, that's the that's another interesting point, though. It's like the death certificates say, you know, there always, you know, a lot of people die of pneumonia or something like that, but you know, it could be brought on by cancer. You know, there's a lot of underlying things or or maybe even back then they didn't know, like he died of whatever, you know, there were- Yeah, I do. Unidentified I do. things. And nobody did autopsies. I mean, even my father, we didn't do an autopsy on him. I, and we, I think you're even recognizing some of that now with the pandemic going on is occasionally you'll see somebody that's saying that they've passed away from COVID but right. they might have had other conditions that have contributed to that as well. So it's a re really weird year, but anyway. Yeah, but no, another point of ambiguity of just kind of like not not knowing the answer. Yeah, for sure. So you start a description on the Androscoggin River in its um, Where do you want last to paragraph. Where it starts when I walk along. Yes, I love that paragraph. And I just, would you, would you read that to us? I will. When I walk, it's the Androscoggin River, of course. When I walk along the Androscoggin and over its bridges, I try to see the river as it was or could have been. Even in its current spoiled state, it's still a thing of great agency. The transactions of its waters, an awesome sight, wearing down granite and earth with the repeated force of its movement down at the rocky oak crops, when my father was a boy, a park with a bandstand and grassy plateaus wrapped the town with music and tranquility. There you can imagine the thunderous negotiation of the river's, river's turbulent waters as they passed, defeating the submissive notes of flutes and clarinets. Before my father, my grandfather walked in the same path where shrubs and flowers and little stones drew a path amid the shade of chestnuts that were about to die. Before him, Abenaki crouched along the Androscoggin's edge to catch salmon lofting on its tide. Salmon had long flung their way upstream from the Atlantic to spawn, swimming past floodplains and alewives that gathered in the river's current. Gristmills and pollution and dams and the lawmakers discouraged their run-ups, but the hopeful salmon pressed on and they, until they disappeared, except for the few each year who still hurl themselves up and over that first dam, wondering if by tenacity they will prevail. Their fate, it remains unknown. It's like mm. us. <laughs> I just I just love that. I mean, it's so, Thank the you. description is so beautiful, but it also, throughout the whole book, I was thinking this thought, and, and part of it is because how I've spent my own summer. <laughs> I've, been, I've spent a lot of time in the woods. I live in the woods, so that's a natural thing. Um, but I did a lot of research of Native Americans and how they survived some of our harsh winters up here. But one of the things that I thought, and especially since you mentioned it, them in, in that description, is what would they think if they saw what a waste filter that would be, that the Androscoggin would be at this point? Have you thought about that? I haven't, but it's a really interesting question to think about. I mean, I guess we could... I guess we could talk to the Penobscot right. <laughs> and ask them their river. Um, I mean, didn't the Penobscot just have like a bunch of 
stuff from a paper mill. Wasn't there a big sludge dump recently? Oh, I did not hear that. But uh, I was- like a, some kind of, I could be totally wrong. Um, something happened recently, but um, I haven't thought about it. But you, I like what you just said too. Was it is the river is like a the river, just like our own blood is like a recycling unit, you right. know, for for all the toxics that are. And that's what that's I guess that's what galls me is that you know the regulations can sort of allow that to happen at the rate and the the persistency that it does. And I'm not radical to say you know the mills should shut down. I mean I'm just saying they can do better, you know, or, right. or regulators can do better. They can make paper, as my book is. If you look on the copyright page, did you notice that? I didn't. You what didn't? did you say? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Now I'm really excited. On the copyright page, it says, <laughs> it says, um, um, where is it? God, I can't even find it. This book was printed on paper bleached without chlorine gas, chlorine oh, yes. dioxide, or any other chlorine-based bleaching agent. And I should say for the people that don't know, the, the process in which paper is bleached creates one of the most dangerous toxics known to humankind, which is dioxin. And... Um, but it can be produced in a different, safer way. And that's why I, I got my book printed on that kind of paper, but we had to go to Canada to get it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, like I say, I'm not saying, you know, progress shouldn't happen. We can't do that. I'm not, I'm not for going backwards, but I'm for going forward in just a smarter way. Like, like it must be, you know? Why can't we, you know, it, it just seems like it's possible. It, it is possible. People are doing it. People are making paper without that kind Clearly. of, <laughs> Clearly it's in my, it's all my books. <laughs> so was that, was that something that you. Yes. Sure of you insured. I did. I asked for it in my contract. Well, that's great. And at the beginning of the year, I'm going to start emailing all my publisher friends and asking them to consider it too. Oh, that's, that's a terrific, a terrific thing to do. Yeah. And I, and, you know, it's interesting. I shared with you earlier that I was a graphic designer and I've been responsible for the purchasing of a lot of paper over the years. Right. And, um, the whiter the paper, the nicer the piece It's it's really a concept that was through my mind a lot. And then right. reading this book, I'm like, whoa, you know, like if I would have realized the impact of that, of those decisions, then definitely would have taken things into a different way. I started to help. Uh, I, I started to help this group. We, I went to town first. I did like an, ed- we did an educational film, me and Rebecca Martin, who is, um, was from Rumford as well, who's really, a, she's a water activist. I'll, I'll call her that for shorthand, but um, she asked me to go help her. And we showed this film and got people really energized about kind of the damage that Nestle can do to small towns. And this this particular film focused on Freiburg, Maine. And then after the film was over, people were like, oh, you help us, you know, we want to set up a group and start learning more stuff about this process in which Nestle is going to, to do. And so I did, I started helping and, you know, driving back and forth to Maine, but also in Connecticut. And um, over time though, they sort of were like, well, maybe you shouldn't be involved in our group anymore. And I was like, what do you mean? (laughs) They're like, well, you're, you live there and you're not, you know, you're not here. We need to get things done. I was like, but, but you can do everything online, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Um, But, you know, you know, and, and it's slowly my, posi- my, my sort of involvement with the group just ended. And, you know, I, I was mad at first. I was, cause I was very passionate about this. And I was like, I really want to be involved. I feel like I can make a difference. But then, you know, I realized that really the change needs to come from them. I can yeah. do my part. I can write this book, you know, I can talk about it in this book. I can do other things. I can make phone calls. I can do other things. I don't need to do what they're doing and they were feeling everything so much more acutely on the ground than I was. And I, I think that's really true for sort of any kind of change. And 
you know, people are always like, what can you change? What's going to change? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not here to make solutions. I'm not here to prescribe things for people. I'm here to reveal what's happening. You know, I don't live there anymore. It's not, it's not up to me. Um, but here's, here's what I see, you know, from my perspectives. And, you know, if you want to do something about it, great. I, I really wanted part of this to be a revealing and a breaking of a silence that has been long held, not in just my town, but in every mill town across America or in Maine, not just paper mill towns. And there's, everybody makes that Faustian bargain. Mm. And it, breaking that, I feel like at least from my, where I'm sitting has allowed people to, I mean, I get really incredible emails every day with long emails from about stories. And I read every single one and I respond to everybody. And it's really, it's giving them, whether they do anything or not, at least there's that, you know, there's yeah. something, there's some kind of like loosening up, right? Yeah. Like loosening weeds, you know, when you're, when you're weeding your garden, all the roots are sort of breathing. So that was one thing I was hoping that would happen. And the other thing, um, you know, I, well, there's several things. I would, I would like to see paper made differently in the United States, like I said, and that's a campaign I would like to continue on in the beginning of the new year. I've been too busy talking about the book to do that. <laughs> but, um, that I also, you know, I also thought as the election, during the election, when that was happening and still is happening, there's been so much discussion about, you know, um, what working class people are like. And and this this book, I didn't know the election was coming and I didn't know Trump was going to be here. I didn't know any of this madness, but I did know that there were a lot of misconceptions about the working class. Hmm. And I wanted to write a story from the working class, me being from the working class, about the working class, about real people, that nobody's a hero in this book and nobody's a bad guy. Everybody's just kind of like doing their thing. You know, I don't think anybody comes off as perfect. They did a study, EPA did a dioxin study. It was like took years and years and lots and lots of millions of dollars. And then they came out with these this report, instead of saying, here's the cancer risks of dioxin, they came out with the non-cancer risks mm -hmm. and they published that. And they're like, this is like immune problems and I, I don't know, other stuff. I have lists of it if you want them. And then <laughs> the cancer report, which basically would say, you know, basically what they they dis, they confirm science. There is the science, but like I'm saying, they're not standing behind the science, so that's why we can't quite prove it. The science says that like one molecule, like you eat a hamburger and you're putting yourself at, at a risk of cancer because there's so much carcinogens in the beef that. That's that's why I would eat venison over lobster because I think deer just eat like plants. Um, so anyway, that that's kind of what we're talking about when we talk about this EPA report. I would love to see that report published or handled properly, and I would like dioxin like banned. It's it's as bad. As, you know, you talk about those persistent PFAS chemicals. It's it's as bad, and it's and it's showing up in farms in Maine right now. I've just been reading the news because they used to take mill sludge and put it all over farms all over Maine. They used to use it as fertilizer. Wow. Well, it's, it's persistent in the environment and bioaccumulative, meaning if if somebody, if cows are eating that and it gets into their fat and then we eat the cow, it, it actually is stronger and more potent in our bodies. And then if I had a baby and breastfed the baby, the baby would get it even more. So it goes, as it goes up the food stream, it gets stronger and more powerful. And there, I've just seen recent, very recent articles a week ago about them finding persistent chemicals in farms in Maine. So really? It's not a past issue. <laughs> no. Well, clearly if it's not banned, it's definitely, I mean. Yeah. It stays in the environment too. You know, they, it, right. it definitely, it comes, I should say in 1997, the government put really uh, strong restrictions. So it's made in a lot less quantities than it used to be like dramatically less, but it still exists. And uh, thank you so much for sharing all of this with, with, with us and the world. And I hope that there are some positive things that come from it. Other than the accolades, you've gotten so many accolades from the <laughs> book. It's amazing. Um, oh my gosh. I think I listed some on one of our posts, but you have Oprah.com <laughs> has endorsed it. You have New York Times article 
wow and a publisher's yeah. weekly but i think it goes on you have like it goes on people newsweek i don't know the los angeles times just today before i got on awesome. they said eight books i'm going to tell everybody it's eight books you should read instead of watching hillbilly elegy so and that's what i learned about the working class yeah which I, i'm particularly proud of that one so well, I mean, it's great because I think that's what we've all come to do during COVID is there's been a, we've been seeing a big rise in readers. But read, 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 buy yeah. books. If you've bought Milltown, buy more books from Heidi. Yeah. Thanks. So Carrie, before I let you go, can you share with us your website address so people can get more information? And yes, and my email too. If you anybody wants to email me, my email's on there. It's Carrie, K-E-R-R. Well, you can see my name up on the thing, I think. So it's carrie-arsenault.com. That's it, carrie-arsenault. Or you just Google Carrie Arsenault and it will probably show up top, top list. But yeah, my email's there and there's lots of pictures of Rumford, old pictures, new pictures. There's That was neat too. Yeah. Some resources, which I'm gonna get going. And there's a few other projects that it started. Cancer Yearbook being one of them. But anyway, there's a lot of stuff there. I think that will probably build traction as time goes forward. Too. That's also another thing I need to start doing in January. Yeah. So, but thanks, Heidi. This has been great. I, if you want me to drop in, like drop dive bomb into your book club, I will. Oh yeah. That'd be cool. Anytime. All right. Or anybody out there. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Thanks for everybody that joined us tonight thanks too. This was a great conversation. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for watching and listening to In Conversation with Carrie Arsenault. To get your own copy of Milltown, visit us at our Main Street location in beautiful Fort Kent, Maine on America's First Mile, or visit us online at www.boganbooks.com.